stand and sing with us. Every mouth that cries for food, every lung that yearns for breath, every eye that searches through the dark for light. Our creation looks to you for its breath and for its food. From the goodness of your hand, Satisfied. Oh, rejoice in all your works, King of heaven, King of earth. Every creature you have made declares your praise. We rejoice in all you've made, God of all sustaining grace. With a mountain, sky, and sea, we sing. in hope to be made back. All creation looks to you for its breath and for its food. From the goodness of your hand we're satisfied. Oh, rejoice in all your works, King of heaven, King of earth. Every creature you have made declares your praise. We rejoice in all you've made, God of all sustaining grace. With the mountain, sky, and sea, we sing your praise. May the ponderings of my heart and the song upon my lips, with the chorus of creation, Join in praise to the God who made all things, to the Spirit who sustains, to the God who over all creation reigns. Oh, rejoice in all your works, King of heaven, King of earth, every creature you have made declares your praise. We rejoice in all you've made, God of all sustaining grace. With the mountain, sky, and sea, we sing your praise. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Discovery this morning. I want you to take a few minutes and greet one another. to return to your seats as we read our 
opening scripture passage, which comes from Revelation 5, 11 to 13. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength, and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, and under the sea, under the earth, and on the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Sing to the Lamb who is worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Firm foundation. 
Thank you, Lord, for oh, for for so many things, uh, for promising to comfort, uh, to bring peace, to care for the needy, uh, to love us, uh, and most of all, thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your sacrifice on our behalf, so that we could have a relationship with you and with our Heavenly Father. Uh, I pray that uh, we would keep all those things in mind uh, as we uh, live each day, uh, not taking for granted who you are and what you've done for us. In your name, amen. And I think you can be seated, but we might have to stand through the verse again, so, you know, sit at, at, your, uh, at your own risk. Good morning. Let's stand for the reading of the memory work for the month of April. It's the last four verses of Psalm 46. The reason why we do this is not only to follow an ancient saying that we want to be searching the scriptures, but we want the scriptures to search us. In order for scriptures to search us, we have to be in it, whether we're reading it or whether it comes to our mind. So let's say together these words from Psalm 46. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease. He breaks, he breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. At this time, we would also like to uh, dismiss our kids for Discovery Kids. If you are in the Discovery, don't sit down yet. To uh, dismiss our kids for Discovery Kids because, oh, yes, you can, because we're going to watch a video before I read more scripture. You may take a seat and then get ready to bounce back up. It'll give me time to get my new microphone maybe ready and adjusted. So uh, on our fourth Sundays, we've been going through some different podcasts that are about the Holy Spirit. The goal of this team, when they do these hour-long podcasts, and we just listen to about 15 minutes worth, is that they come to the end of it and they put a video together of the things that they have talked about and the things that they've learned. I just thought it could be helpful for us as we were getting ready for one more podcast on the Holy Spirit on the fourth Sunday in May, just to see where they're going and what their plan is with this. So this is a five-minute video from the Bible Project. Uh, some of the things, if you've been here on the fourth Sundays, they will be recognizable to you, but you'll also be able to see the direction of where they're going. So uh, at this time, maybe if someone can hit the lights in the back, it might be a little easier for us to see the video. And uh, Dan's going to roll it. Thanks, Dan. If you've ever heard the phrase, the Holy Spirit, and you want to know what it means, where do you start? Well, you have to start on page one of the Bible, where the uncreated world is depicted as this dark, chaotic place, but then above the chaos, God's Spirit is there, hovering, ready to bring about life and order and beauty. Okay, but what is God's Spirit? Yeah, so the Spirit is the way the biblical authors talk about God's personal presence. The Hebrew word is ruach. Ruach. Yeah, you gotta clear your throat at the end. So what is it? Well, ruach can refer to a number of different things, but what they all have in common is energy. Energy? How so? So there's an invisible energy that makes the clouds move or the tree branches sway. Right. Wind. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. Okay. Now take a big breath. <sighs> so you feel that inside you. Yeah, the air? Well, specifically the energy, right? The vitality in your body that you get from breathing deeply, that too is ruach. 
And this is the same word used in the Bible to describe God's personal presence. Just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Yeah, Ruach. Now, as we continue on in the story of the Bible, we see God's Ruach giving special empowerment to people for specific tasks. The first person in the Bible this happens to is Joseph. God's Spirit enables him to understand and interpret dreams. And then it happens to this guy named Bezalel, and he's an artist. God's Spirit empowers him with wisdom and skills. He's given creative genius to make beautiful things in the tabernacle. And we also see God's Ruach empower a group of people called the prophets. They're able to see what's happening happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the prophets saw it. While God's Ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil. They've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes, and the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart, to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's spirit happen? Well, centuries pass and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up and God's spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. The story is saying that God's spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now. Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus, and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's spirit is at work. The earliest disciples of Jesus, who saw him alive from the dead, said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after that, the Spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's Spirit. And so today, the Spirit is still hovering in dark places. Yes, pointing people to Jesus, transforming and empowering them so they can love God and others. And the Christian hope is that the Spirit is going to finish the job. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a new humanity, living in a new world that's permeated with God's love and life-giving spirit. And so hopefully there were some things that were recognizable to you and maybe some things that were new, but also some things that can show us where it is that we'll be going in these next uh, month or two. We have in the front of each of the three sections a prayer pad and it's an opportunity for you to be able to share your prayer needs or your prayer requests, your praises with the Discovery family. So as that goes from the front to the back, it gives you the opportunity to write something down that we send out then on Monday and then also throughout the week, you can also email a prayer request as it comes in along the way of your daily life. And we can get that on the next prayer email that comes out. Our scripture reading for this morning is in Luke 14. And now I'm going to begin reading at verse 12. And uh, I need a little feedback down here, Dan. I don't know what that is. We had to change mics like uh, one second before I walked up here, so we're I have something going on. As Dan is working on that, we're going to read uh, Luke 14, beginning at verse 12. You can follow on your tablet or a phone or a book or just listen as I read the verses aloud. I invite you to join with me by standing either in spirit or physically in reverence before God as we hear these words from the book that we love. 
Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. And still another, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done and there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house may be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get to taste of my banquet. God's very word. Thanks be to God, and you may be seated. Thank you. The family table is a place where we feel we all belong. Whether it is blood family or not, it's a place where you know you're welcome when you come to the family table. And welcoming others to your family table is a wonderful thing, but it is filled with some risk because people might be a little bit messy at your table. They might not follow your expectations in their coming. They might spill things, they might use their sleeve as napkins, they might not be using the right utensils if they use utensils at all, and chew rather loudly. But for people to know that they are truly welcome, that they belong, they need to be welcomed regardless of any mess they come with. Because as followers of Jesus, we know God has welcomed us with all of our mess. And so he calls us to take that same welcome and extend it to others. Researcher Eric Carter did a study of families that had a family member that had a disability. And these families who didn't go to a church. And he asked them, why don't you attend? What do you need in order to get plugged in? Well, Dr. Carter, as he met with hundreds of these families, developed what he called the 10 dimensions of belonging. Some of you picked up the sheet as you came in. Some received it uh, two weeks ago. That belonging has to do a lot more than simply just being welcomed, but being fully a part of the community. There's one up there called Needed. It's on the uh, upper left hand, it's green. He also gives a description on the paper that is part of the handout of what being needed means. And he says this, that each person brings gifts to the community that are seen as indispensable. That each person, regardless of any handicap they might have or any disability that they have, is fully included in the community and engaged and using gifts and skills for they are seen as indispensable. And that's what he found out families wanted. They wanted a place to truly belong. And uh, it, start, it strikes at the very heart of what it means to be the body of Christ, that we need all parts. 
not just the public parts, but all have the opportunity to contribute, though in different ways. And so we're going to be exploring for the next little while what it means to engage and fold, show that all people are needed as part of the family and God, including those who might have a disability. Part of that is found in the story that Jesus told in Luke 14. It's a parable that talks about guests who come to a family table. He talks about the guest list. And as he talks about the guest list, the people who think that they should be invited are not necessarily the people on Jesus' guest list. Jesus is having a family meal with someone, with a large group of people, and it's likely there's someone up there who feels like they are worthy to receive an invitation to come to the table of Jesus. But instead, Jesus has a very different and a radical guest list of people he invites. The guest list for Jesus includes the crippled and the lame, and the poor and the blind, the misfits, the homeless, and the diseased. One translation puts it this way, all who look like they need a square meal are on his guest list. The list includes people who don't have anything that they can contribute in the same way, something they can contribute, but they probably couldn't host a dinner and invite the master back. In fact, probably some of the people who were invited to the table couldn't even get to the table on their own. They might need some help. And so in this story, Jesus is showing what the Father's table is like, that it is set for the vulnerable, it is set for the forgotten. It's set for those who can't reciprocate back in kind. He says when throwing a banquet, when opening up your home, welcoming people in, don't just invite your family and friends, but people that you know who need to feel that they belong and are accepted and are welcomed and are needed. So Jesus talks about the guest list, and he sends out three different invitations in this story. He says that the banquet is prepared, the feast is ready, and so this rich master sends out his servant to go to those who, first of all, probably feel like they deserve to be invited to this man's house and to sit at his table. Now, it was a custom in those days by those who were fairly wealthy to send out get-ready-to-be-invited postcards, uh, a pre-invitation invitation. I'm going to be throwing a banquet, and you're going to be invited. I don't know really when, but just get ready because the invitation is coming. And when the invitation came, those who were deemed worthy came up with their excuses. I just came into some money, so I got to study the market. I just bought a Corvette, so I got to check it out. I just got married, and my spouse won't let me go. Three excuses that the Jewish culture would have not viewed as acceptable. Now, if you've been watching the series called The Chosen, there is a part of the story that talks about this. And it confused me a little bit because their portrayal was that these excuses would have been acceptable. Acceptable excuses. Now, the people that I go to and the people that I read, people like Ken Bailey, come out and say these excuses would not have been acceptable. So that's the direction that I'm going with. Ken Bailey says if someone would have given this excuse to not come to a banquet, they would have been scoffed and laughed at. Because when the invite came, they were expected to come. In fact, it would have been an insult that they would have given to the master not to come. 
And as we get into the story and we read about the excuses, we must remember that we have our own excuses too, don't we? When we are given gracious offers from a very generous master and king. Excuses that speak about our own comforts and our own convenience. Well, that's the first group of invites that were sent. Probably to people who felt like they deserved to be invited. Well, the master is furious, but it didn't stop him. So he orders his servant to go out and to bring in others. And so we see in here the first command to go out to others. Go out beyond your circles and go out to others and let them know the master's feast is ready. Pull in the homeless. Pull in the poor. Go out and meet the destitute. Go out to the beggars. Bring in those from the nursing home. Bring in those from the halfway house. All those that the world would look over and reject. Bring them to this great banquet. It's part of our story, isn't it? We could say that's probably a likely group we could be in. We could be spiritually homeless, morally bankrupt, spiritual bad people who are outside of God's grace and goodness, and he reached out to us, and he brought us in. The invitation is made wide, and it reaches the marginalized, and it reaches the hidden. Uh, he mentions in here, go to the streets, and to the alleys. The streets were the well-traveled roads where you would expect to find the beggars. That's what you'd expect to find on the streets. And the alleys were alleys. They were hidden. They were on the side. They were the place where others went who wouldn't want to be seen, or a place where they were put so others couldn't see them. They would put in the alleyway. So the servant is called to go past the nice neighborhoods, to go past the synagogues, and find these people. The kingdom of God includes all those that the religious elite would not accept in. And included in that group would be the Gentiles. A radical concept that sitting down at the table with the Jewish people would be the Gentile people. An expanded guest list. And the servant goes out quickly and he fulfills the master's desire. Well, in verse 22, the servant says that he has done all of that. He has gone into the streets and he's gone down the alleyways, but there are still empty tables at the banquet. And so in verse 23, the servant is called out to go into the highways and the hedges, the roads, and the country lanes, some of the translations say. The roads and the country lanes include those locations around the city where the untouchables were. And the servant was to do more than simply invite them. He was to compel them to come. And he wouldn't start the banquet. The banquet wouldn't be complete until all those who needed to be gathered would be gathered in. So all those who made excuses, who chose their comfort and their convenience, who would not go to the banquet, they would not even get the smallest taste of the Master's Feast. Well, as Jesus tells the story, as I retell it, we clearly see that this is a story about God's outrageous grace. These are all pictures of the grace that Jesus offers. Because who among us hasn't been physically, emotionally, or spiritually poor, blind, 
or crippled. Did you feel like any of those adjectives described you, who you were? In what ways had we been, or are we, poor, blind, and crippled? Who among us hasn't had bouts of fear, times of discouragement, being slighted, and the hurt that comes with that? Here comes the Master's grace. A grace of forgiveness, a grace of new life, a grace of restoration. And it's given to all. No one is outside of the invitation. And that's why Jesus came. He came and suffered and died and rose again so that anyone and everyone could receive that invitation. And through faith and repentance could come into this family meal that Jesus was hosting. Well, that's the grace. It's the grace to come to Jesus. But there is a second kind of grace. And that is, it's a grace that's called to the community. God's grace goes to others through us. He commissions us as individuals to go and to compel people, and he compels us as a community to go, to find, and compel, and to bring in. The place that we meet needs to be a welcoming place, just as Jesus welcomed us to his place. This offer of grace is not just for us and what we do in our daily life. This offer of grace needs to be done by the community of faith that gathers together. And the offers that we have and the invitations that we send out, that people can find God's grace if they're feeling physically, emotionally, spiritually crippled, blind, hurt, or outcast. The church extends that grace to those who cannot reciprocate in the same way. This is God's guest list. And he always wants our guest list to work off of his guest list. And just made me wonder, who are the people that we have on our individual guest list? Who are the people that we invite over? Who are the people that we call up and want to meet for lunch, meet for coffee? What does that look like? Would it be spattered with people that would be on Jesus' guest list? And then how are we doing as a community? Going not only in the roads, the alleys, the hedges, the backwaters, the places, places where most people are forgotten and inviting them to come in too. It involves moving beyond our typical friendships, finding people who are different so that God can show his grace to them through us. That's what it means to be a community of grace, that we're working together to make that invitation compelling. So when others come, we offer them the blessing of knowing that they can belong to God and they can belong to his community. And for people to discover God's grace and belonging with God's people in today's world, they need to experience an unconditional acceptance that Christ's church offers to people. If God's grace is the seed that needs to take place in people's hearts, then the radical acceptance of God's people to others is the soil that allows that seed to be planted. The seed is the grace, and the soil is the acceptance of God's people. 
for people to know about the grace of Jesus, in spite of everything, that they can be accepted, that they can be forgiven. Words alone don't do it. Words like, Christ died for your sins. Words like, for God so loved the world. For many, the words don't have the impact that they did years ago. Many people won't believe that those words are true until they feel it, see it, and experience it. In fact, many people don't even know those words. Do you remember a football player by the name of Tim Tebow? Remember him? He uh, played for the University of Florida, played with a few different pro teams, won the Heisman Trophy. Very expressive in his faith of Jesus Christ. You know, football players, they, they, they put this thing under their eyes, supposedly to cut the glare out. I don't know if it's true, but they do that. Probably looks pretty cool. And so they, they have these things under their eyes. And so uh, at the national championship game of college football, Tim Tebow put down there John 3.16. Google had almost 100 million hits during game time of people who wanted to know what John 3.16 was. We might take that for granted, but our world, our community, wants to know. How can we get that out? Not only by what we say, but by what we do. Jesus knew that talking about God's outrageous grace and his acceptance of how we are was not enough. So Jesus, he, he lived it, he expressed it, and he gave picture after picture after picture after picture of what the invitation to God's grace was like. He said, it's like a shepherd risking 99 sheep to find the safety of that one lost sheep. It's like a father who had been rejected by a son and that son moves out and squanders the wealth and he returns and the father humiliates himself to give the son a warm welcome back. Jesus said it's like the picture of a housewife who jumps up and down because she has found something that seemingly is worthless to others was something that was valuable to her that was lost and then was found. Jesus said, God's grace is like the man who throws a feast and tells the servants to go out and to bring people that others have forgotten and let them taste the juiciness of God's banquet. So over and over and over again, Jesus wanted to let people know that Father God was not their enemy, but he's the one who's been searching for them, longing to be with them. Well, what does that mean for us? How can we respond likewise in the things that we say, in the things that we do? Not just as individuals, wherever we live and work, go to school, but how can we do that as a faith community together? To embrace the vulnerable, the forgotten. I shared a couple of weeks ago that in the study that uh, a joint effort of our denomination and the denomination of the Reformed Church of America put together in looking at disabilities in North America, uh, that one out of every five households has someone with a disability. And so if you think about where you live or where you work, one out of every five has someone with a disability. And they have found that many of those households, greater than average, don't have a church community, a place where they can feel needed, welcomed accepted. We know that that happens with people of color, and so we fight against the evil of racism. But it can also happen to 
someone who shows up with a disability, that they find out that there is not a place set at the table for them, that we don't have access for you. We haven't prepared ourselves to welcome you. We're not ready to have you as part of our church. It's a difficulty that churches have to make sure that the church is ready and equipped and the people are practicing good etiquette, good words, good sharing. So anyone that comes in, people are welcomed warmly, accepted, supported, cared for, befriended, known, and needed. Eric Carter, who put this together in his study of families with someone in them that has a disability, found that uh, families often don't come because they're viewed, going to be viewed as messy, and they know that they're going to be a family that requires some extra care. Wrong way. There we go. And so he's put charts together, and others have put charts together like this, where uh, the blue dots represent us, for the most part, and the colored dots represent people who would have a disability of some kind. Well, they're often, they are often experience church as being on the outside looking in, or they're all kind of segregated together. But the goal is to include them, not only to include them within the fellowship in a certain area, but to include them in all areas of the community. Find out what their gifts are, what their likes are, areas where they can serve, areas where they can care. And there's a big difference between churches that are ready to welcome and churches that are not. So Discovery's leaders and previous leaders have acknowledged that every person is made in the image of God, is valuable, important, be treated with respect, cared for. And all people can be important parts of the body of Christ in the body of Christ called Discovery Church with their gifts and with their challenges. We not only want to welcome people who have a disability, we want to learn how to be better trained to use the right language, the right etiquette, and to have a good support system ready. We want to be committed to valuing people the way that God values each and every person and ready to engage with them, find out their gifts, discover how best we can come along and go on the journey with them with their struggles and not avoid them. So that's part of the journey that we're on and part of the journey that we're on during the late spring and early summer. In my mind, maybe not in yours, our studies the fourth Sunday of the Holy Spirit and the studies of looking at what the Bible has to say about reaching out to people, caring for them, enfolding, welcoming, engaging people who would have a disability, people who would be uh, maybe unacceptable in other circles. Those two go together because one of the great callings of the Holy Spirit who not only comes into the lives of believers and empowers us, but he empowers us for action. He empowers us for ministry. He empowers us to move beyond ourselves to others. And one of the great ways that Jesus moved out is that he reached out to others that many others had forgotten. So let's do what we can to follow that example. We don't want to separate the teachings of Jesus from the practice of Jesus, but to meld them together. I invite you to join with me in prayer.
Father God, we bless you so much for offering your warm welcome to each of us, whether through a friend or through a family, whether through an event, whether through a word or prayer. Thank you for inviting us to come and sit at your table. Thank you for preparing a place for us. Thank you for sending your son to suffer and die and rise again so that we have a pathway to come to your table through forgiveness and faith in Jesus. We know that your welcome exceeds beyond these walls, beyond these doors. We pray, Father God, that you would empower us by your Spirit to offer your invitation to those around us at work, at school, at home, where we play. And that people would not only hear of that invite, but they would feel it and experience it through us. We pray that you will be with us as a faith community, as part of your body, so that we too can properly invite and welcome and care for anyone who would come and long to be a part of your family and sit at your table. Help us to prepare your table well. Help us to do what we can to make sure the places are set and that any barriers have been removed and that we can welcome with words and with heart anyone who comes. Father God, we lift up the body of Christ here at Discovery Church. For as you have drawn us together, we care for each other. We want to express that we need each other. And so we lift up the needs of our faith community to you. We lift up Hugh's dad, that your grace and care would rest upon him, on Hugh's mom, and upon their whole family as his dad, actually his parents, face his father's cancer journey. We pray, Lord, for your peace and freedom from pain and your comfort. We pray for Jen's dad and for his upcoming procedure. We pray, Lord, that you will keep him safe, protected, that your peace and comfort would rest upon their family, and when the procedure comes, that that would go well. We pray for Calvin Quinlan. We pray, Lord, that you would be with the ongoing challenge with his heart. We pray that you would bring the healing that his heart needs. We ask that that healing would come and that when they do their next scan in three months, that they would find progress and they would find a, a good result from the scans that are done. We pray for Richard's upcoming surgery, not this week, but the following, that you will provide healing and health for him, that that would go well. We pray, Lord, for our family members who are in need of extra measures of grace, for Gail and Gil and Joe and Pam. We pray, Lord, that you will give to them uh, double measures of grace on days in which they feel especially in need, and however they feel that need. We pray, Lord, that they would be assured and reminded of your great love and care for them. We pray for our students and administrators and teachers and parents. We pray, Lord, for our students' learning, that it would be directed so that they can see your hand in every aspect of creation. Keep leading our young people. 
so that they can see your desired future for them as you lead them in their education. And we pray for families that are struggling, struggling in so many levels, but we pray for our families. We lift them up. We pray for families that are asking for wisdom, asking for restoration, asking for strength. Father, we join with these prayers. We pray that you will provide. We pray for your church worldwide that is sending the word out. We pray for our missionary partners in this day and this week. We pray for world renew. We pray for the Siwalkas that you would be with them to strengthen them as they minister to people in South Central Africa, not only teaching them ways to care for their families, ways to care for their community, but as they also share the good news of Jesus. We pray for our neighbors on Sun Metal Drive. We pray that you would give to them an extra blessing this week and that they would know that that blessing comes from you. And so we pray, Lord, that you will continue to fill us with your spirit. Give us the eyes of Jesus. Give us the love of the Father. Give us the power of your spirit to see those in need and to not pass them by, but to reach out through your care and your love to show who you are. We pray these things, Father God, in the name of Jesus. And everyone agreed and said, Amen. Pastor Paul told us about the grace that we've received uh, and the commission we're given to go uh, as individuals and as a church. Um, and that grace is an invitation to the table as well. Um, so uh, I pray for myself that I would not be one who uh, finds an excuse to not come to the table uh, and that I would be one who would be going out to welcome others. Uh, but I also recognize I'm really good at making excuses. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's only through Christ that we're able to do the things that we've talked about. And uh, let us not take his grace for granted. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I. I dread, I know I am for 
But you're sure the price you have been paid For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon And he was raised to overthrow the grave To this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my peace sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me by day, I know He will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, Still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. It's not long till the boastful are silenced and shame. It's not long till the wealth of the wicked is reclaimed And the ones who have waited with eyes on the Lord Will shine like the sun forevermore It's not long till the day of the Lord Just be still and be faithful Trust in the Savior and cling to His hand. When your heart burns with anger for all that is wrong, do not let the dark steal your song. It's not long till the day of the Lord. It's not long till the day of the Lord. It's not long till the 
day of the Lord. Everything that is broken will soon be restored. It's not long till the day of the Lord. It's not long till the day of the Lord. Amen. There are several things that are going on in the life of Discovery Church that we want you to be aware of. And uh, just going to take a little time. So that's all right. Uh, here we go. So following our worship as in every Sunday, we have prayer servants who are available believe that they're going to be in the back corner that if there's something from the week past or the week ahead that uh, you would like some prayer for they'd be delighted to minister to you in prayer and at the same time our prayer pads which did go back if you want to still add something you can find one of those pads and add a prayer request to that to make sure that that goes out we have an opportunity to uh, practice a little bit of what we've just been talking about in terms of uh, helping s with someone in need, and Bob's going to come up and share about that. Bob. It's actually a perfect day, the sermon, and then some of the bureaucracy that's going on that you don't know about. That there are two families in our church that are going to be shifting from their current housing situation into new housing, which is a delight. But we won't know when that's gonna happen. And we're in the process with um, the bureaucracy of when an apartment might show up. <clears throat> is it the right place? And probably not an apartment that has furnishings, kitchen stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm asking you because the process is far enough that it could happen any time in the next week four weeks, we hope, not more than that, but it could be. But here's the problem. When a phone call comes to say it's ready, you gotta go or you lose it. So I talked to Sarah about that this morning, Sarah Barnaby, and she's gonna create, with some help, the list of the possible things to put in a two-bedroom apartment or a one-bedroom apartment, including some kitchen stuff, right? Because both of these potential families will move without anything. Clothing. So I, th I think what I'm asking for is if you receive that email and that list and you can fill in and maybe you have some other ideas and we could do that. But be praying, be aware, please be willing because we're going to need trucks and people on very short notice. Okay? So that was like the first invitation that some another invitation is coming, but we don't know exactly when. So uh, hopefully this, this week. Uh, next Sunday as we gather together, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. So I want you to be aware of that and be doing any soul work that you need to do, any relationship storing that you need to do before we uh, come together at the Lord's table. Uh, we are transitioning our uh, dawn prayer from Thursday morning to a Wednesday noon. So it's a half an hour on Wednesday on Zoom. The link is on Monday memos. So you can log in at 12 or even a little after, you'll be invited in and we pray for the things in discovery. We also want to invite you, if you want to log in a couple minutes earlier, gives us just a moment to chat and kind of catch up with those who do that. And uh, it's going to be every Wednesday, uh, starting at noon. Uh, there is a meal train that's still available and one that's going to be coming around the corner again. So uh, an opportunity to minister and to care for a family that has a new addition 
and to bless them with a meal so that they can have a meal for that evening and a whole bunch of leftovers afterwards. So the place to sign up for that is on the meal train uh, item that is uh, on your Monday memos. Maybe we'll be outside next Sunday. I don't know. The eight-day forecast says that it's supposed to have a low of 45 Saturday night. I am not sure that's going to be warm enough. But we'll see. But the goal is, starting in May, whenever we can, to go outside without uh, someone's hands freezing over the keyboards or the guitar strings. So that's uh, part of our goal. So watch out for those emails. They come out late in the week. Where are we going to be? We're going to be outside. We're going to be inside. Don't quite know for sure. You also find in your worship bulletin a uh, green insert. And it's just called Summer Happenings, Summer Fun at Discovery, uh, just to let you know and to plan for things that are going to be taking place. Not only to remind you of the mobile food pantry that happens once a month, but the last Wednesday of the months of the summer, we're just going to be calling it a Church and Community Picnic, just an excuse to gather together to have a picnic together on the lawn as a church family to play a whole bunch of yard games and make everyone feel silly and just to enjoy being together. So those are going to be on the last Wednesdays of the month. So uh, there it is. There's also going to be the Critter Barn coming once again. That's a big draw for people in our community, people in our neighborhood to come. I think last year we had over 120 different families show up to the Critter Barn. So there's a date for that. There's also one where we get to go together to a White Caps ball game. And it's a great deal because we have one of those decks reserved. So when you arrive at the gate, you can go right to the deck. It can, you can get your dinner right there. And then about the third inning or so, they kick us out of there and we have to go to our assigned seats. But uh, the way it's set up is that on that day, you arrive at the stadium and you go to the deck. And there will be your Discovery family, and we'll have a time of being together, and then later on we'll find our seats or whatever it is that you want to do. So all of that is found on the green sheet, and uh, dates that you might want to circle and prepare for. So I uh, just want to let you know and be aware of that. I'm going to hit this reminder again. We did it at uh, the beginning of the year. I'm going to do it again. That Lectio 365 is an online app that gives you a devotional for 10 minutes at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. I really enjoy it and appreciate it for a whole bunch of reasons. A couple of them is that uh, I can just tune in and it leads me in prayer and leads me in the scripture verses. But also I am able, because a bunch of people are doing it, when I meet them throughout the week, I said, hey, did you hear the app today? You know, did you hear that in Leviticus about loving the stranger, loving the immigrant as you love yourself? That sounds a lot like something that Jesus said. Hey, did you get the Elizabeth Elliot quote that uh, what I need is not me in different circumstances, but more of Jesus in me? You know, and, and when you listen to the same thing as a community, you can see each other during the week and say, hey, did you hear this? Hey, how did this hit you? You know, and it's a great thing to do, and it's an app on your phone. It's easy peasy. Uh, so I want to encourage you to think about that app. It's a great way to st start your day, a great way to end your day. It is an ancient practice that we are able to do uh, together in a way that uh, many of us feel is meaningful. Uh, okay. Are you ready for a challenge? This is, this is my challenge to you. Okay. You've got to pick out a day next week, this coming week, a day this coming week, where you're going to be out amongst people. Now, maybe uh, you're a teacher, administrator. You say, I'm always going to be around people. Well, then you just got to pick a day. Okay. My challenge to you is this. For that day, where the shoe you would normally wear and your oldest, dirtiest looking boots or hiking shoe. So you have one 
normal shoe and one not so normal shoe and go through the day wearing it. And when someone asks you, why are you wearing two different kinds of shoes? You can say, well, my pastor asked me to. I don't know why. I'll let you know on Monday. Okay? So do it this week. We'll be talking about it next Sunday. Uh, that's my simple challenge to you if you're willing to take it up. So, and I'll be doing it too. I can't give you a challenge without me doing it. So I'll be doing it too. I'll be walking around one day with uh, my biggest, cloudiest hiking boot and a normal tennis shoe. So that's my challenge. Uh, last announcement has to do with our young people. Uh, Will and Rebecca have planned and reserved some lanes to go bowling with our young people. Will, you want to say anything about it? It's up there. It's all up there. There it is. So it's coming the uh, latter part of May. There will be more about it on Monday Memos and other places. So this is sort of letting you know that they're uh, planning some things for our young people. So I think I got everything covered. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit to receive God's parting blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance upon you, smile down on you, wrap his arms around you, and give you his peace. All God's people said, Amen. Go in peace.